Okay, good morning or good afternoon, whatever the case may be. Thank you all for joining Friar Levitt's webinar today. Our attendees are joining from states across the country and represent a range of academic, corporate, chain, institutional, and independent participants in the healthcare delivery chain. My name is Anthony Mahajan, and I'm going to be speaking to you about a subject that is quite near and dear to my heart, given the number of cases I have in this area, that is inventory shortages or inventory shortfalls. And since joining Friar Levitt earlier this year, we have been seeing a dramatic uptick in the number of cases pursued by state and federal regulators involving um, the types of inventory shortages that we're going to be discussing here today. So I thought it behooved us to share out what we are learning and observing from these cases. So before we dive into the substance, um, please um, accept that the information provided today is not being provided in the context of an attorney-client relationship. I know a number of you are either current or former um, clients of my firm. However, today's presentation is being made to a broader audience. And so you should appreciate that the information is not being provided in a confidential or privileged manner. I think most of you know about Friar Levitt. Um, we're a full service law firm that for the last 20 years has been laser focused on serving the healthcare space and life sciences space. We advise participants throughout the supply chain from large corporate entities to individuals and executives. Our headquarters are located in uh, New Jersey and New York, but our attorneys are admitted um, in states across the country and we service clients nationwide. And so let me take this opportunity to plug um, New York. Um, should you find yourself in the city, it's a wonderful time of year to visit um, with the holidays um, upon us and the city and the businesses there reopening. Um, please reach out. Um, we're down by the World Trade Center. It's a great um, place to visit, especially um, uh, following the memorial services um, for the 9-11 um, terrorist attack that, that just occurred there. There's a museum um, not too far from the office. And so should you find yourself in the area, please let's have a coffee and connect. A little bit about me. I'm currently the chair of Friar Levitt's White Collar Defense and Government Investigations Practice Group. I previously worked as the Chief Compliance Officer for United Health Group and before that as a Vice President of Compliance at McKesson. Um, both companies obviously um, touch you know, an, a number of different areas within healthcare, including distribution services and PBM. And I oversaw compliance in those companies uh, across their platforms, the Optum platform, United Healthcare, uh, McKesson's distribution businesses um, with respect to all of the different types of legal obligations that are underfoot there. And prior to working on the corporate side, I served for nearly a decade as an assistant United States attorney in New Jersey, where I investigated and prosecuted a number of um, businesses and individuals for various healthcare related offenses, including controlled substance obligations. Um, so in, in the context of just appreciating, you know, the, the nature of the cases brought by regulators, and I'm going to be focused today on, you know, state and federal regulators, not um, private um, uh, industry that may um, kind of be, be involved in, in inventory shortfalls, such as PBMs, for example. So what I like to do is to bring to bear some of that corporate background in any case involving a regulator, because I, I guess I didn't fully appreciate um, the complexities that are 
kind of inherent in healthcare when I was on the other side, when I was working for the department. And so um, one of the things that I think is very helpful in, in defending these cases and, and, and posturing and positioning for success is to educate the regulator that you're dealing with. And, and I'm going to speak to that a, a little more deeply today. So just in terms of the agenda, before we talk about some of those strategies, I wanna just make sure we're level set regarding the genesis of these cases. And you know, just to a small degree, highlight some of the applicable law. I think it's important to understand the enforcement landscape as well because dealing with and understanding the regulators that you might have across the table is in, in itself a defense strategy because you need to understand kind of the priorities some of those different offices have. And having um, worked at the federal level and partnered with a number of state enforcement partners, it's a really complex set of relationships that can alter or change the landscape in your particular cases. Um, from, from there, we're going to talk about um, some specific case law, um, including cases brought in the administrative, civil, and criminal forums involving inventory shortages. And the purpose of that analysis is to help you understand and appreciate the number of different factors that might be considered in any given case. And those factors may be aggravating factors in certain, certain circumstances and also mitigating factors. So understanding the case law prior enforcement actions will help you best position the case that you're dealing with and the factors that you have um, in, in your matter for success with, with regulators or if necessary with the jury. So, so, you know, just focusing in on what we're talking about today, there's any number um, of reasons for inventory shortages, as you may know, including theft, human error, allocated products, and you know, as simple as changes in prescribing behavior that can cause short stock situations. Um, while those issues are certainly business challenges that require attention, today's discussion will focus on true um, billing discrepancies that are suggestive of actual inventory shortfalls. So frequently these discrepancies are resolved in a manner that proves that no product is actually short or missing. For example, if a physical count is off. Other times, however, a reconciliation or audit does show that product is actually missing from inventory. And two of the more common factual scenarios that we encounter in this respect are either that the product was billed and never dispensed to that particular patient, or that it was billed and never ordered. So as I mentioned, we're going to really dig into your interaction, um, if um, the case may be, um, with state and federal regulators. I'm not going to address um, the kind of genesis of some of these cases, other than to point out to you that we have at Friar Levitt, I have a department that is dedicated to um, attempting to avoid um, any adverse findings relating to inventory shortfalls in the first place. Um, because as we've seen, investigations by the government frequently result from adverse PBM audit findings. And therefore it might seem obvious, but the best way to defend against these allegations is to aggressively contest them at the audit stage. So there are a number of publications that we've put out with respect to how to respond in a robust and vigorous manner um, to any PBA, PBM audit in this area. So I'd like to draw your attention to that. You can find um, these publications 
on Friar Levitt's um, website by searching for the word inventory. And they're not lengthy. And I hope that the short amount of time that you will spend digesting them will be um, valuable to you in the event you have a PBM audit in this space. I also want to touch a little bit on the applicable law, but um, some more of that detail was provided in an article that I published um, a few months ago with respect to um, the very um, uh, numerous and complex regulatory regime that could apply to an inventory shortfall situation, whether that be administrative to criminal. Um, please check out the article if you're um, interested in digging into, the, into more of the very specific statutory details, as well as some other um, uh, reference that we have uh, previously published in this area. Um, so today, um, what I want to do is to not necessarily spend much time discussing specific inventory requirements applicable to controlled substances, but um, you should understand given today's landscape that regulators are rabid when it comes to anything controlled substance related. And so therefore throughout um, my presentation, you should, and if you take nothing away from today's presentation, other than this, it would be helpful. That is, if you're dealing with shortages around controlled substances, that is going to be considered an aggravating factor that you will need to address head on and that regulators will be very closely scrutinizing. And some of that relates to other um, regulations that kind of apply um, insofar as these regulations would limit potential defenses in an inventory shortfall situation where it turns out there's actually a shortfall, such as um, the obligation that's on the screen. I'm sure you know, many of you are aware that you have an obligation to report to DEA um, significant loss or theft of controlled substances. Um, there is some ambiguity uh, built into the law. It doesn't say you're required to report um, any loss or theft above X uh, dosage units. Um, it requires consideration of, in terms of what's significant, uh, likely candidates for diversion, for example. And that's going to de depend on ge geographic trends and local prescribing patterns. So the rule does incorporate some discretion and leaves open arguments that will be, would not be available in a more bright line situation, such as if you were required to report any loss, for example. But again, um, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that the intense focus on this area has changed the dynamics at play here. And it is truly unfortunate uh, that the pendulum has swung so hard to the other side um, and doctors are refusing to prescribe to patients in need for fear of regulatory attention. In fact, I um, gave a presentation to a group of neurologists at NYU in Manhattan, you know, one of the foremost medical institutions in the country, and they expressed concerns um, that I would not have thought they had given the nature of their practice. So I think it's telling to me that if this group of physicians were concerned, the bulk of physicians out there likely have changed their, their prescribing practices to some degree. And I think many of you have seen that firsthand. So it also bears note, and you should keep in mind that those who have not changed um, even slightly in the current environment will be viewed as outliers and considered outliers in the data. So, so that's uh, going to be a relevant consideration in your businesses as well. Just to talk about um, some of the practical considerations around 
um, how these cases come to the government's attention. Um, the, they may um, arise through the DEA cyclical audit and inspection process, which could reveal shortages, though more likely the diversion investigators who, who visit on a cyclical basis are not going to be doing inventory audits. Um, and, and so therefore the PBM invoice or purchase audit scenario is far more likely. And just in terms of the background in, in how these audits are, are viewed by the PBMs, they typically allow only for product purchase during the inventory reconciliation um, period. They may permit a short extension in certain circumstances. And, and the reasoning is that the normal pharmacy um, delivery window is the next day for, for, from large wholesalers. And so therefore, given cash flow constraints and ordering um, practices, there's no incentive to overstock so, such that they don't typically accept arguments that you know, six months ago you purchased an amount that should be considered in the audit. Um, it's also customary to have 12 turns of inventory. And they also reason that many pharmacies use automated processes that um, place an order um, as soon as, as, as the, as the um, product is billed or dispensed. Um, the upside is that the uh, PBM audits are typically uh, limited to the claims through that entity. However, given this day and age, the reach of the PBMs has um, gone far beyond the simple um, corporate entity that may be involved in your audit. And we've seen, seen that there's been kind of cross-pollination among entities such that um, one entity in one state may have information and suddenly um, there's other scrutiny brought by a related entity with respect to other claims. And so um, it's, it's not transparent. We have some information about uh, these relationships, but um, the takeaway is that although the audit is limited to the claims at issue, there could be um, some broader exposure given the related company nature of the PBMs. As I mentioned, there's been an, a fairly significant up uptick in the number of referrals by PBMs that have been accepted by state and federal regulators. I don't think you need to search too hard for reasons why that may be the case with states dealing with some very tight budgetary constraints. Um, these audits provide a source for enforcement and whether they be prosecuted as criminal cases, civil, um, as we'll talk about, they're often settled in a manner that kind of returns funds to the state or, or federal government. So in that respect, um, you should kind of have some understanding of the enforcement regime out there. Uh, the state landscape is um, kind of the attorney general's office and, and Medicaid fraud control units, the MUFUCOs, that um, most frequently are, are bringing these cases on behalf of Medicaid. And obviously 2020 is going to be an aberrant year, but we track this data very closely and we have analyzed it on a granular basis across states. You should understand the um, uh, way your state Mafuco unit operates, how active it is, where it's brought investigations, the type of investigations that it has brought. And um, this data is available. Should you have any questions uh, about it, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, though you can find it on the internet and do your own analyses should you so desire. Um, with respect to the federal landscape, the U.S. Attorney's offices where I worked in uh, Newark, New Jersey, are the litigating components on behalf of the Department of Justice. They are separate and distinct from that department. Um, they have both criminal and civil um, departments within those U.S. Attorney's offices, and there may be different offices um, within the same state. So, for example, in New Jersey, we had three. There's a number in New York. Manhattan, Brooklyn, Northern New York. 
Um, and those um, prosecutors frequently partner in task forces with um, state agencies where Medicaid and Medicare overlap. And they don't need to be formal task forces. Sometimes they unite uh, for purposes of a specific case. Now, the US Department of Justice is separate, as I mentioned. They have their own healthcare strike force units that operate across the country. Um, they're situated in specific regions. And those um, units typically bring you know, pretty large scale cases, the largest cases using uh, data-driven analyses to identify um, potential subjects. With respect to the enforcement regime and, and kind of the spectrum for these cases, they can be resolved for um, any number of implications, um, the most mild being, um, you know, obviously no finding, but if there is an issue, um, you go from breach of con uh, contract and, and termination issues to potential BOP licensing and administrative issues, then amplified from there are civil lawsuits and false claims acts, um, which seek to recover the, the amounts of claims billed um, by a multiplier of at least two times the amount, either billed or paid, there's dispute about that. And then finally, um, in the more serious um, circumstances, uh, these inventory shortfall situations can subject individuals to um, criminal implications and in incarceration. So let's look a little bit, unpack these arrows. Um, see how they, how they shake out in practice by digging into some specific cases that I've pulled together. Um, so in the context of the civil cases, and I have, you'll see that there's a little bit in here from the administrative side, but I've really focused on the, the right-hand side of that arrow, the more severe um, cases, civil and criminal, because that's the world I live in. Um, so with respect to uh, the case uh, depicted on this slide, this came out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, which is interesting, I know, because they don't even have a, a False Claims Act. So therefore, um, when you're in the um, District of Pennsylvania or before the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office, uh, and I have a number of cases there, you have to come up with creative strategies to, to structure settlements so that if they are going to be uh, settled civilly, you have a basis in the law for settling a case involving um, billing and, um, or potential overbilling uh, on a um, theory that gives money back to the state where they need it. Um, unlike other states which have false claims uh, acts themselves, and so therefore that's a vehicle that you can use. That's the uh, vehicle that often um, requires a multiplier on the amount billed or paid uh, of at least two, two times that amount. So here, INL Express Pharmacy, we don't know how much Medicare was billed. There was a $3.2 million civil settlement, six years of claims at issue. You'll see the medications were billed, but not actually dispensed. As I mentioned, you know, one of the more common factual scenarios, and that could be for any um, number of reasons. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, the typical drugs are, are depicted here. Um, we see these drugs um, across cases. Um, you know, there's various reasons for that. You could speculate as to that. But in any event, this was a civil um, resolution. There was a, a integrity agreement um, entered into on a parallel basis with OIG that permitted the owners to continue operating um, with substantial compliance obligations and the imposition of an independent review organization, organization that kind of does additional monitoring audits of claims data and the like. Another one out of the uh, Eastern District of Pennsylvania, GNA Summerton Pharmacy. Well, I wanted to bring this to your attention is because we do know from uh, the information uh, that's publicly available in the case that the pharmacy billed Medicare for over $1 million for prescription medications that were never actually dispensed. Same factual scenario. Here, however, we see that the settlement figure is 
million. So that's only a very, very small uh, damages multiplier that was applied in this case. You'll see a similar number of, uh, of, of years at issue. So a long course of conduct here involving, again, the same drugs. Here, however, um, the owner and, and uh, pharmacist in charge did agree to a, a 10 year federal uh, exclusion. I'm not going to comment as to the, the, whether there was negotiation on the money side versus the exclusion side. Um, I don't have insight. I didn't represent um, Somerton in this case. So then um, perhaps a poster child of, of bad behavior that never resulted in criminal implications is the uh, CareMed case out of the Southern District. And, you know, the Southern District is, 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 as, is as aggressive as they come when it comes to um, pursuing um, any type of theory, whether that be criminal, civil, or, or, or otherwise. Here, um, there was a $10 million settlement. Um, we don't know the extent to which um, the billing was, was um, uh, at issue. Um, we don't have those amounts, but the conduct was that um, CareMed failed to reverse submitted claims for payment and then sell the previous, previously um, billed refill dosage to another customer. So essentially selling it twice. But on top of that, and I don't have it on, on this slide, um, but I know from uh, my knowledge of the case, um, they, they went out to patients and essentially asked them if they can have their medication back and rebuild it. On top of that, they uh, were involved in submitting um, fraudulent uh, prior authorization forms that were, were uh, inaccurate, um, to say the least. And so um, despite the $10 million civil settlement, um, there was no criminal um, implication there. Uh, and there was only three years of claims at issue, but the, the wrongdoing in this case was extensive. Um, so that, you know, if you have a case involving inventory shortages, this is one of the cases where you could point to, to, to differentiate your case from other cases if you're arguing that your case should be resolved on a civil basis. So just to kind of hit on the OIG cases, you know, it's not just independence by any measure that um, cases uh, have, have been brought involving inventory shortages against. You see CVS Pharmacy um, allegedly double billed for immunosuppressant drugs for the same patients on the same data service. Um, that was resolved administratively, a small amount there. Um, and so you could see that there's a, a, a number of different ways in which these cases are handled short of, of criminal um, theories. However, you should also understand that, you know, it may be that a criminal um, prosecutor will be the first contact with you or the pharmacy or entity involved in a suspected inventory shortage because of the nature of the organization. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. That, however, should not necessarily dictate how the case um, will be resolved. And we had a number of cases in which the first contact was by criminal authorities. And those cases, as in the cases depicted in my presentation here, have been resolved civilly. So, you know, what distinguishes a criminal case? There are some aggravating factors. You know, I mentioned controlled substances one. Um, McElroy Pharmacy here, uh, picked again the Eastern District of PA. Here they were submitting false billings to Medicare by billing for more expensive brand name medications while dispensing the less expensive generic versions as well as the fact that they were illegally dispensing hydrocodone, other controlled substance without requiring a prescription. So, you know, here you see kind of some conduct that is a little more aggravated insofar as they were switching medications uh, than the situation in which a claim is submitted and there's a failure to reverse, for example, uh, and there's criminal implications. They were state implications, not federal. Um, but also this, this individual was, was barred um, 
uh, from ever um, dealing with controlled substances and then uh, nine years from the federal programs. So just in terms of kind of the, the cases and some observations that can be made, and I've only highlighted a, a small fraction of the cases that we here at Friar Levitt have analyzed and used affirmatively in presentations on behalf of clients as we you know, really do counsel that the affirmative strategy that is going in, um, making contact, making a presentation about the client's bona fides, the landscape is the best way to handle any inquiry from a criminal or civil regulator. Um, so um, in, in terms of just summarizing that, that information for you, um, what we see is that there are criminal charges in cases involving kickbacks. So um, if there is a relationship between a doctor and, and, the, and the prescribing uh, or the filling dispensing pharmacy, that is a, a common fact scenario in criminal charges uh, involving inventory shortages where there's a lack of medical necessity there. So that kind of goes hand in hand a little bit and, and very large dollar amounts. Although I, I point out that you know, that's to be compared um, to the care med situation, um, which itself involves very large dollar amounts, um, some extensive fraudulent conduct, and nonetheless was, was settled civilly by the Southern District. So just in terms of kind of the, the takeaway here um, at a high level, um, understand your regulator. So understand if it's the Mafuco unit, what the priorities, are of the states, how those entities tend to investigate a case. I don't think it's um, a surprise to anyone if I say, you know, the states typically have less resources than the federal authorities and therefore um, are not as effective in terms of litigating cases if they need to be litigated. Um, so therefore they often partner with the U.S. Attorney's Offices. With respect to U.S. Attorney's Office versus U.S. Attorney's Office, this differs across states. So you need to understand what is the structure of the regulator you're dealing with. So for example, what, what um, I want to kind of share with you is that in New Jersey, the um, criminal um, uh, prosecutors in the healthcare unit are co-located with the civil um, prosecutors in the healthcare fraud unit. And so what that means is that there is kind of crossover of facts and scenarios and that if you have a case in a criminal um, posture in one of these offices that is uh, structured similar to the District of New Jersey, and there's a number of them out there, um, you're, you may go in and effectively present for resolution of the matter on a civil basis versus a criminal basis, and you'll be dealing with both set of regulators. And I want to contrast that with main justice. If you're dealing with main justice, the DOJ strike forces, you know, that are regional across the country, New York, Boston, Florida, um, their, their kind of reach is, is pretty broad. Um, those uh, units do not have parallel civil investigators or regulators. And so um, to them, if the case is not resolved on a criminal theory, it's effectively not um, a, a good resolution from their perspective. And so it will be that much more difficult to convince those individuals to refer a case to the civil part of, of main justice. Um, and you'll have to kind of appreciate that dynamic as random as it is. Uh, leverage the spectrum. That's the um, second takeaway. Understand, appreciate you know, that these cases may be resolved on any number of theories because they implicate laws, rules, regulations across the um, range of, of statutes from administrative to licensing to civil to criminal. So use that and use the um, information about similar cases, dissimilar cases to position your case 
for the best outcome given that range of, of outcomes. Uh, and then finally, contain the exposure. Um, you know, so obviously incarceration is, is the most significant and severe of, of potential consequences. However, these cases are extremely difficult cases to prove. Um, oftentimes there's not documentary evidence regarding the individual's knowledge and intent. That is, they have to show there's a specific intent to fraudulently bill this, this uh, federal or state program. And there's often a number of other participants in the, in the chain, that is the pharmacy tax and the like. There's a number of records that um, criminal prosecutors will need to analyze. And frankly, just as the states are not as effective as the federal government, the federal government is not as, in most cases, not as effective as the PBMs in analyzing the records, collecting the records. Though, the, the, you know, I don't want to overstate that they, they are, depending on kind of the, the unit at issue, some of them are fairly experienced in this area. But my point is the same, that these are difficult cases to bring. They involve a lot of considerations and there is not typically the type of evidence and the quantum of evidence that federal prosecutors or, or criminal prosecutors need to have, that being evidence uh, showing proof beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, and so therefore, um, knowing that um, you can kind of um, negotiate, hopefully, for a, a much more palatable resolution for you and one that doesn't um, kind of uh, occupy as, as much state or federal resources, but still serves the underlying goals involved. And so therefore, arguably, you can um, um, kind of position it as a win-win. So that um, concludes um, the substantive part uh, of this webinar. I'm happy to kind of follow up with you. I think we have a little bit of time here for, for questions. Have my contact information on this on the screen. You can go to Friar Levitt's um, website, learn more about my background, what my group does, our theory for litigating these cases and the types of cases that we litigate. And, um, you know, uh, should you wish to reach out, you have my contact information. I welcome any further conversations. If you have questions, I'll, I'll, I'll try to take some now. Um, and, and if not, uh, I hope all of you have a wonderful um, fall and look forward to connecting, hopefully at some of these conferences as, as the country begins to open up. So one of the questions that I've received is, is it easier to defend PBM audits versus Medicaid, Medicare audit? I have to say, frankly, I'm not an expert in the audit space. We do have a number of individuals, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that specialize in the defense of audits. And you really do need um, the type of breadth of information about the way different audits are conducted to adequately answer the question posed. So I don't want to do um, the participant any uh, disservice by trying to um, answer it in a kind of a generalized manner. Um, it will depend on the type of PBM audit at issue as well as the Medicaid Medicare audit, what specifically they're looking at. It'll depend on the, the, the exposure. Frankly, it could even depend on on the on the PBM, and so those are all strategies that go, you know, that that frankly could be addressed in a, in a separate webinar, and and so I apologize, but I'm going to um, ask that um, this individual pose the question just to follow up more specifically if there's questions, or allow us to circle back with a, with a more um, a robust answer to the question of how how best to defend various types of, of audits. But I, I do think there is some uh, information available on our on our website about that, should you care to, to, to search that website. Okay, well, um, seeing no further questions, uh, I thank you uh, for your time. 
And that concludes uh, today's webinar.